Welcome, everyone, to another episode in Voices with Raviki. This is episode two with Vivian Dittmar. Uh, we're discussing a lot of issues uh, around her work and how her work interacts with mine. Uh, we're, we're moving into this topic of the transrational, but we've also been discussing things around affect and agency. Um, it's just wonderful to be doing this uh, again. Uh, Vivian's video got so many good comments. Many of you were pleased, as was I, with you know a, a strong female voice in entering into this uh, little corner of the internet and adding her wisdom and her particular perspective. And so it's a great pleasure to have you back, uh, Vivian. And so maybe just quickly again, just in case some people are jumping in and uh, on this one and they haven't seen the first episode, quickly reintroduce yourself. Um, and then what points do you want to sort of get people to remember? Because they might not have seen episode one. And then we carry it in and we can just go into this one. So welcome. Sure. Thank you so much, John. I'm really excited to be back in this dialogue and to continue comparing notes in a way. Mm, yeah. So my name, as you said, is Vivian Dittmar. I've been researching in my own way uh, matters of consciousness and also particularly feelings, emotions, and affect for most of my life, initially involuntarily, and then increasingly, um, I got really fascinated by the subject. And yeah, like I shared in the last episode, um, I, I had a very unusual upbringing. I'm not going to go into it. If you're interested, go, in the go into the first episode. But what it really gave me was um, a, a very different perspective on the human condition and on our situation right now and the crisis that we're in, the poly crisis. And I believe our inability to feel our, and also the great many misunderstandings we have around the phenomenon of feelings, emotions, and affect is um, one reason why we're so lost. Uh, so one of the things I've done is I've created a map to distinguish different types of sensations. We talked about that, five different types of sensations. Yes. Physical, um, instinctive, so biological programs, then the relational forces, which I call feelings, the emotions, and finally the, I guess what you would uh, associate with the higher states of consciousness, uh, which I call the also states uh, of consciousness or abilities actually, such as the ability to truly love or to truly trust, um, et cetera. So that's something we talked about. And then we talked about a practice that I developed, which is the practice of conscious release. And I feel it's really crucial because it allows people to bridge something that in many people is separate, which is their higher developed consciousness, the higher states and abilities, the compassion also that many people have been developing through meta meditation, et cetera, um, to bring that together with our shadow aspects, with our immature parts, with the things that we usually suppress and deny. And by bringing the two together in a powerful practice, I found that really, really profound healing is possible on the emotional level. People mature, people develop wisdom, and we get out of this pattern of just repeating life experiences over and over. And that's actually a key. This kind of emotional cleanup, clear up is a key to accessing transrational thought, which is why I'm super excited. We're going to talk about that today. A fantastic. Wow. What a fantastic uh, uh, review of your work. That was very, very succinct, but very elucidating. Thank you. Um, so. Let's pick it up there because um, um, this it, it strikes me that it's kind of a dialogical model here, and I just want to make clear if that's right. That there, there, I'll just use a, a, a couple of quick. Well, there's sort of this sage state and the shadow state, or if, if that's good enough. And what your practice is doing is putting them into some kind of dialogical process. And it, it and I is this. It, is it mutually transformative? Is it integrative? Uh, is it reciprocally opening? Is it the sage shining light into the shadow and the shadow giving some power to the sage? You, you, I'm bringing these up because I've heard multiple versions of this in different modalities. And which one or all do of them land for your, your practice? Well, what we do is we really stress the importance of switching roles. So when we do a practice, both uh, practitioners go into both roles. And uh, that actually completes a cycle. 
And one of the things that we found, there's some people now in Germany who are using this with like complex traumatized patients in, in like a clinic setting. And they found that actually when people come in super unstable, they go into the sage mode first. They go into the supportive role first and that stabilizes them. And then they go into the shadow mode, just to use your terminology. Yeah, yeah. And um, so, so it's really important to understand that both are practitioners and you benefit from both roles and they complement each other. And it's the contact between the two states of consciousness that's transformative. And being in a sage mode and confronting yourself with someone suffering and immaturity and shadow actually deepens your practice of yes. remaining in sage yes. mode yeah, yeah. and vice versa. Like by being in, in the shadow and then being confronted with a being who is in a higher state of consciousness in that very moment, even if it's just for five minutes, does something and it allows you to shift and process. That's, that's really beautiful. And uh, I take it from what you just said that this eventually can also this eventually gets internalized in the practitioner so that they can start to get those they can start to do this on their own to some degree is that what yes. happens yeah well what happens you know i like to use the metaphor of the emotional backpack and i with time i've come to discern between the weight and the size of the backpack so, <laughs> <I> like that <laughs> yeah i've actually developed a formula to calculate the the size of the backpack and uh, I don't know if we talked about that last time. I, 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 it sounds vaguely familiar, but... Uh... Yeah. Well, I, I can just recap it. Um, it's like the, the size of the backpack can be calculated by the intensity of the life experiences you've had multiplied by your sensitivity divided by the support you've had to process whatever you went through. Oh, that's interesting. That's very interesting. Yeah. So what happens, though, is that... Um, with time, like as we process a lot, our backpack, to stay with the metaphor, might stay really big, but it might become lighter. And I equate that to increased emotional capacity. And what that means is an increased ability to be with what is, to feel what's happening, and to process it in the moment so that we don't carry it with us for later processing, which is the purpose of backpack. So, so mm -hmm. oh, yeah. Uh, do you want me to? I, I don't know. I, I, I don't want to interrupt your flow, but I also want I, you provoking yes, a lot of go. questions. Uh, so that, uh, how does that relate to a lot of the ongoing discourse around emotional resilience? Are you building up or, or emotional equanimity? Is that, is it aligning with that or what you're talking about? Is that what's happening for these people? Yeah. 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 Definitely. Okay. And what I feel is super important to discern here is the distinction between like developing resilience and also uh, equanimity versus training uh, to dissociate, which is right. what happens a lot when people just go into meditation and they feel like the aim is to just not be identified with all that stuff, but it actually leads them to not engaging, not feeling, and actually losing agency. Yeah, right, right, right. So, so this process is, it's, it's not only building up emotional resiliency. It, uh, does this land for you? It's also building up emotional discernment, like you're getting better yeah, uh, right. Is that uh, right? Uh, that's what Definitely. I'm hearing you say. Yeah, right. Definitely. Right. And and one of the things that's so important that we talked about last time is the discernment between feelings as positive relational forces that actually um, increase my agency. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And emotions which put me into a state of suffering and uh, cause me to lose agency. Right, 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 right. Yeah, yeah. So th that's very, very helpful. Okay, so there's this theme of, uh, you know, getting this dialogue, uh, enhancing emotional resiliency and emotional discernment, and that also is giving people the ability to, uh, to uh, identify more with, uh, like, feelings that are agency-enhancing as opposed to emotions that are agency-debilitating in some fashion. Yes. Excellent. Yes, and also okay. learn to shift from one to the other. Right. And then this, if I understand what you said a few minutes ago in your preamble, this is kind of like an affordance or platform for the, the development or cultivation of trans rationality. Do I understand you correctly? Is it, it's or a is prerequisite. It a, it's a prerequisite. It's a okay, prerequisite so. because as long as we don't do that, and I know that we're both super aware of this, the internal space is completely cluttered with unfelt emotions 
And that actually feeds a lot of unnecessary and unhealthy, even pathological mental activity. Right, right, right. And, and that uh, creates so much noise inside of us that we don't have access to the much more subtle signals that um, actually are, are the, the hallmark of transrational thought. Oh, so there's also, there's also uh, something like a sensitization process that's going on. We're, we're getting an ability to quiet the noise so we can become aware of sense, have a, uh, th these more subtle uh, patterns and processes and presencing of this uh, uh, of the sage mode or, or however we want to call it. It, it. Did I get you right? Yes, exactly. So say more about that, because that's really, really juicy. Let's let's really slow down and open that up. So expand that out a little bit more. And and then maybe, I mean, we we talked about it before, uh, but maybe a little bit bring in, because um, I, I think these two points are connected. One is this, like the unpacking that process, but one is the distinction that you're making use of between the transrational and the merely rational, if I can put it that way. And, yeah. and so if you could maybe address those two together, that would, I think, be very helpful. Is that okay? Yes. Yes, I'd love to do that. And actually, I want to bring in a third distinction. Sure. That was first uh, brought up by uh, Jean Bernstein, uh, which is the pre-rational versus yes. the transrational. And I'm yes. sure you're familiar with that. Yeah, right? yeah. It's crucial, especially in these times. It sounds very similar to Wilbur's distinction between the pre-egoic and the trans-egoic that he made. Yes. He criticized yes. Jung about. I think he yeah. borrowed it from Jerome Bernstein. But anyway. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay, okay. So same thing, yes, we're talking about the same thing. And I feel especially today, it's so important because we're witnessing a lot of people falling back into pre-rationality. Yeah, yeah. And um, yeah, so one of the reasons why I, I wrote a whole book about the subject of transrational thought, I called it the inner GPS. And one of the reasons I wrote it was because I was so frustrated with this phenomenon and I wanted to create a map to make sure people understand that transrational thought needs to be married with rationality. And these faculties need to learn to cooperate uh, unless we're going to fall back into the pre-rational and get really confused. Thank you for watching. This YouTube and podcast series is by the Verveke Foundation, which in addition to supporting my work, also offers courses, practices, workshops, and other projects dedicated to responding to the meaning crisis. If you would like to support this work, please consider joining our Patreon. You can find the link in the show notes. So, so is the fallback into the pre-rational in, in some ways driven by the, an ignorance of an experience or knowledge of the transrational? Like, it be, because people may be trying to escape, like I talk about prop, propositional tyranny in certain yes. aspects, yes. and the only alternative given to them to the culture, maybe a decadent romanticism, is to retreat into the pre-rational because they have no sense of the possibility of the transrational. Is that is that... I wish that were true. Like I, I used to think that. Okay, and, so what do you um, think that? In, in recent years, I've come to see that a lot of people who've had very genuine and powerful transrational experiences have turned away from rationality because of those experiences. Oh. And were then really, really vulnerable to pre-rational bullshit, to use the term, and um, have not really learn like because of i do think it comes out of a rebellion against the propositional tyranny as you call it yeah um and this rebellion like then they have an experience of the transrational the transpersonal they have a mystical experience altered state of consciousness and suddenly everything is magical and everything is amazing right right right, right. and then they become really vulnerable to narratives that offer really really simple explanations and i think the the reason is that we don't have a good education on discerning the pre-rational, the transrational. And this is why I've really zoomed into that. And I really want to talk about that because there's so many distinctions. To yeah, be made. yeah, yeah. Okay, let's focus on that. I just want to get that point uh, because that seems very convergent with an, uh, a larger argument. Uh, sorry, that's not the right word. An argument I've been making for sort of a larger phenomena where people, one of the things driving the meaning crisis is people have anomalous experiences and they don't have a cultural framework for properly processing them. Yes, yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. And what happens, that's also what happened to me because, you know, my early childhood was spent in Bali witnessing a lot of things that according to our worldview don't exist. And I kept going back and forth. And all I was told by the very arrogant um, Western worldview was just like, 
that doesn't exist. Your experience is the completely devalidated my experience and just said, no, that, that didn't happen. And I just went back and I witnessed it again. And, and what happens to people when, when they get that kind of feedback is, and, and they have an experience that is so true and so sacred, for them, it actually discredits the scientific worldview. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah and yeah. That's, that's a problem. <laughs> well, you know that I totally agree with you. And I've been doing a lot about trying to make from the scientific worldview properly respectful and responsible to these phenomena, which I've been doing a lot about. And that's okay. why you have so many fans. Including me. <laughs> well, you're, I'm a fan of you too. Um, uh, so I like this. Um, and, and so let's, like, I, let, I, I'm really happy. Let's hone in right now on the trans rational uh, versus the pre rational and yes. the, the distinctions you want to make. And then along the way, where it seems to make the most sense to you, how does the the stuff we've talked about before, the dialogues between the sage mode and the, uh, and the shadow mm -hmm. mode, just as a quick pointer, yes. right? Uh, you said that's a prerequisite. So uh, bring out the distinction and then how does the prerequisite uh, help to enable a proper discernment of the difference between the transrational and the prerational? Yes. I, I, I know maybe that's I'm loading a lot onto your plate, but I no, think you can handle that's it. Exactly what I want to talk about. It's fantastic. Okay, great. So let's start with the distinction between prerational, pre rational, and transrational. Please. One of the things that became really clear to me is that the transrational by nature has a very difficult stance in today's world because it speaks to us in a way that is nonverbal, nonlinear, abstract. Yeah, the ancient world had a whole faculty and term for a, the noose and noesis. And that was all lost with the loss of sort of our Neoplatonic heritage. Yes, exactly. I agree. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. So what happens is that there, there's these sensations that come up and they're abstract and they're nonverbal and they're super subtle. And even first of all, very often, like I said, the inner space is completely cluttered and noisy, so we don't even notice them. But if they're strong enough or if we're quiet enough, we might notice them. But then the rational mind comes in and just jumps on it and say, you know, you can't even articulate why. Like, you know, I have a gut feeling that says no, and you can't even get an explanation. And, you know, and it just jumps on it and discredits it completely. Yeah. Ineffable means non-intelligible means useless garbage. Yes, First of all, before exactly. you go on, because I want you to go on, I just want to uh, suppress a moment of appreciation. You're like... I've been looking for more people to have this discussion with. I'm really interested in the phenomenology and the functionality of this, as opposed to sort of abstract, just phil philosophical theorizing. I, I, there's a place for that. I'm not dismissing that, but I'm hungry for this. I'm hungry for the phenomenology of the transrational, and you're, you're unpacking it. So go. Yes. Go. <laughs> I've gone into it for years. So yes, let's talk about it. I'm also very excited to talk to you about it, because I know from a certain direction, you know a lot more about it than I do. So. I'm really happy to put it together. So compare that with the rational and the pre-rational. The rational obviously is, is logical, is linear, is, is verbal. So yeah, it can yeah. articulate itself very well. It can argue. It can not only does it have this linear cause and effect thing, but it can even like do research on it and prove it or disprove it. Like it's amazing. In the pre-rational, we also have a linear pseudologic. So let me give an example, like uh, in the Balinese village where I spent part of my childhood, when a person would get sick very often, the explanation would be that another person cursed them. Right, 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 right. And that's a very simple, linear, pseudological explanation. Right, 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 right. And in contrast to the, the true rationality, of course, it will not stand up to like empirical research. Uh, yeah, it's it, just it, going to fall apart, right? Yeah, it won't stand up to good argument, good empirical evidence, right? Exactly, yeah. and that's how we can discern the pre-rational, the rational. Okay, so let, now, me, let me, let, let me. Let, this is good. I, I, I'm sorry, I'm going to interrupt you because I, you're saying precious things. So you're 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 giving us sort of a a, a working thing. You can say, look, if if it can be basically not dismissed but sort of disproved or disconfirmed by rationality, that's a good marker of the pre-rational. Did I, did I hear you correctly? Yes, yeah, exactly. Okay. Yeah, yeah, okay. And of course, the challenge with that is that the scientific um, exploration of the world is never complete. So we're always going to learn new things and we're going to always have new hypotheses. And then, you know, I don't have to tell you that, but this is part of the challenge that it's not that clear cut, obviously. Obviously, obviously, yes. 
Yeah, I mean, a good philosophy of science, which many people who talk about science on social media haven't received an education in. Yes. Yeah, it's it's very much, yeah, you know, and it, it's, there are, there are, there isn't a scientific method. There's a family of scientific methods and they're all mutually interacting and each one is self-correcting and they're correcting each other. It's a very complex uh, process and it goes through changes that are not uh, totally linear or logical. Thomas Kuhn and paradigm shift. And I won't, I won't repeat all of this so that the people, uh, you can look into that. So I just say total agreement with what you just said. Just unpacked it briefly for people. Go, but go back in. So we've got this way of distinguishing the, the rational and the pre-rational. Now, now I, I foresee a problem and I guess you're going to tackle it. The, pro the problem might be the rational thinks it can treat like it, it, it mislabels the transrational as pre-rational. Of course. Yeah, right, yes. right. Because and of sometimes for good reason. So let's go on. Yeah, yeah. So obviously, like once we go into the rational, we can see, okay, a person might be sick because they caught a virus. They were infected and that's why they got sick, clear enough, or they were exposed to some chemical or they've been smoking for 20 years, they got cancer, etc. Now, when we go into the transrational, and um, people will often experience this, um, of course, as a result of spiritual practice, but also as a result of certain crises. So someone might have a diagnosis and they might have a life-threatening disease and they go into a really, really profound crisis. And suddenly they are catapulted, maybe also facing death, they're catapulted into a deeper sense of what life is, what reality is. Sure. And they have an experience that suddenly feels much more true to them than anything that they have ever thought. Right. It's a sharpening of that. I've talked about ontonormativity. It's a sharpening of the sense of the guiding presence of the really real, something like yes. that going on. Yes yes, yes. 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 Okay. And then what happens is suddenly people have a profound sense maybe of, yeah, that's what your work is all about, right? Of meaning making. Like suddenly they experience their disease as meaningful. Right. So their right, crisis right. is meaningful. Yes. And that's yeah. a blessing. But now something very interesting happens, John, and, and, and I really want to focus on this. So what happens is that they have a felt sense of meaning and it's transrational. So it's nonverbal, it's nonlinear, yes. it's abstract. It's kind of like a super insight because in, insight has a lot of it. It's nonverbal, nonlinear. Yeah, yeah, totally, totally. But you're super excited about it and you yes. want to go tell your loved one. And then you try to put it into words. Ah. Uh, and then very often what comes out sounds pre-rational. Because someone might, might say something like, I had to get cancer in order to quit my job. So what they're saying is, again, it sounds linear causal. Yes, but it's not. I get and, it. I get it. I get it. But, yeah, well, actually, the moment they say it, it actually becomes linear causal because our language is like that. But what they're trying to express is something that is multi-causal. And if we are really on that level of reality, everything is multi-causal. Nothing is, has a singular cause. I mean, our conversation, the, way, the reason that we're sitting here right now Thousands of causes have like come together and restraining factors, et cetera, to make this happen. I totally agree. I totally agree. And so um, let's use, let's, uh, these are a bit tired metaphors, but they're coming back into vogue and I'm sort of part of that. Uh, but, you know, uh, uh, Wolfgang Smith and others, you know, the, here's the horizontal, right? The linear and, but you can get this vertical, yes. which is about all these. I use that a lot. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and and the problem is when we try to express the, and the Greeks said this is noesis and this is dianoia, right? And, and right, and, right. And, and when we try to express this in this, we're into linear language, we're into things that have properties, we're into substance, like we get into all of this. And, 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 and there's a, it, it, would it be fair to say there's, there's a kind of a, a profound mistranslation that goes on? Yes. Okay. Profound mistranslation. Yeah. And, and this is kind of the problem. Like if you're really aware, you feel it the moment it happens. Like you try, you have this epiphany, you try to tell your spouse about it or your best friend. And the moment you say it, you're like, it becomes untrue. It becomes a lie. It has a bad taste in your mouth. But if, you, if your loved one is really attuned, they can feel the space you're speaking from and they understand that what you're actually trying to convey is, is more. Yes, yes, yes. Okay. And, and, 
keep mm-hmm. going, keep going. So, a very so, dear friend of mine, um, yeah. and I, we, we dialogue uh, a lot, uh, very deeply from from these places. And one of the techniques that we use is that when we're trying that when we're trying to express something in that space, we preface it with "Let's assume that nothing I'm about to say is true." This is so neoplatonic, right? It's like it's like this is the cataphatic apophatic uh, interaction. You're speaking, right? But you're always saying, but the speech is in some fundamental way not true because it fundamentally fails to translate or to convey. Yes, yes, yeah. So what what I found profoundly helpful if, in my practice is to really understand, not here, but in a felt sense, the quality of the transrational. This it is what suddenly, I want to get. This, the phenomenology. Yes. So what's yes. that like? Unpack that. So it's, like I said, it's subtle, abstract, nonlinear, multi-causal, multi-causal, multi-dimensional. So far, that went, sounds all right. That sounds perfect. Yes. Keep going. So what I went into um, is two things. First of all, understanding what are the preconditions in a system to even be sensitive enough and quiet enough to perceive these signals. That's one thing. So for that, all the mindfulness practices, uh, the development of transpersonal space, the cultivation of that is very, very important. The practice of conscious release we spoke about is very, very important. Clears out the emotional baggage, calms the mind, creates a space where these subtle signals can surface. But it's not enough. And that's why I created this map of the inner GPS, where I, where I discern five ways of thinking. So I complement the rational thought with four transrational ways of thinking. And I, I speak very uh, precisely about these different ways of thinking and where they show up in the body, because they actually show up in different places in the body. I also refer to it as full body thinking. <laughs> Because I perceive it as like, it's not just your brain thinking, but your whole nervous system thinking. And these five ways of knowing or five disciplines of thought, as I also call them, they actually need to balance each other, interact each other. And also, and this is an important point with regards to your work, also they need to check on each other. Yeah, 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 yeah. So there's a self-correction that's built into this, right? Because each of these has a particular function and purpose, and each of these is susceptible to error. Bullshit and all kinds of yes, including the rational mind, as we know. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, so are there? And so, does uh, uh, the energy PS book? It's talking about all of. And what are you finding? Sort of relations of complementarity between these five, like so, so how they can. uh, relate to act as checking on each other and keeping each other in check, if I can uh, double the language a little bit there. Totally, totally. Yeah. So um, just to be clear, the book is not out yet. We're working on it. Uh, right now, we're about to release the emotional backpack, the one we talked about last time. Super yeah. excited about that. Also, yes. thank you for your support, John. Yes, in, totally. Yes, it's in the work, it's coming. But um, I'm happy to talk about it. So yes, let, let's just talk about the different um, disciplines of thought. Um, so one uh, that I, well, actually, before I go into it, I need to make one thing clear. Again, I have the same problem like with the realm of affect, which is that the language becomes very fuzzy and that when people talk about this, they're not precise in the terminology. So what I do is I use terminology, which I define. So just to be clear. You, you get stipulative definitions. I get that. Did you do any... Uh... Uh, and this isn't a criticism. It, it isn't. It might sound like it, but it's not. It's just a question. Uh, I, I get that you're doing this uh, out of your own, I, I, like your tremendous phenomenological capacity as a reflection. Did you do any cross-cultural analysis? Does this does this match up with what like wisdom traditions across culture and history? I have. Are? Yes. Yeah. Excellent. Excellent. Mm-hmm. Excellent. Okay. Yes. Good. Because as you know, I spent several years in India studying uh, Far Eastern philosophy, and then I spent some time studying with the Mexican shamanic tradition. So I cross-referenced that. And actually what I, what I try to do is I try to bring that into a language that we can apply here today, and then try to cross-reference that with the latest findings in neuroscience, which 
I'm sure you know so much more about than I do. But um, I think it's such an exciting time that by now we have enough evidence to be able to know that intuition is a real thing, right? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, and, I, and I mean, that a couple of decades ago, that wasn't the case. Like people could just completely discredit it. So it's very, very exciting what's happening there. Um, okay, so back to the five uh, ways of thinking. Um, one is intuition, actually, quite obviously. And intuition is super interesting. Uh, I know uh, there's been a lot of research on it. Uh, I believe you've done some research on it. Yeah, implicit learning, intuition, flow states. Yeah, I've done work around that. Yeah, so right. intuition, I mean, it, it's quite amazing because in many ways, like, it, it, it's, it works better than rational thought. And then in some ways, obviously, it works worse. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. It's, yeah it, uh, so in, uh, there's a distinction in the literature, rationality literature, between large worlds and small worlds. Small worlds are worlds in which... You have done all this translation very carefully, and you can apply formal algorithmic thought. And that's where standard models of rationality work very well. When you're out here in large worlds, um, you need a lot more of the implicit learning, the intuitive processing. Yeah. Yeah. More data also. Yep. 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 Yeah. So that's, I find that's really important to educate people on intuition, on how to recognize it. And, and this is where we link back to the practice of conscious release to discern it from emotion. Right. Say a little bit more about that. That's helpful. Yeah. So what happens is that, remember the qualities of transrational thought, subtle, nonlinear, uh, also polite, actually. <laughs> um, now, very often an emotion will pretend to be an intuition, and then it will not be subtle and it will not be polite. <laughs> I see. And it will come with a lot of like a lot of heat. So I might have a very strong sense, like I have to do this. And if I don't do this now, there's going to be a lot of fear and a lot of worry dialogue. That's not your intuition. That's emotional baggage coming up. So this is why the useless advice of follow your gut is useless advice. Yes, uh, Because your exactly. gut can just as much be, you know, whatever prejudice, bias, or emotional baggage, or defensive projection you've built into. Or a biological it. program, exactly. Biological program, exactly. Yes. Okay. So, and at the same time, I'm sure we both agree it's not completely useless advice, because without our gut, uh, I don't think we're capable of navigating this life very oh, well. Oh, for sure. For sure. For yeah. Sure. So, um, it's, uh, it's about learning to discern uh, what's coming up in your gut and to clarify the space and to really see, okay, that's an emotion. And um, that's maybe a suppressed need. <laughs> that's um, biological program. And that is actually a true impulse to act on right now, or a true informed sense also. I mean, that's the second thing that intuition obviously is very susceptible to manipulation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, as, as we know. So, so that's intuition. Um, and it's very, very important to educate the rational mind about the nature of it and how to discern it from emotion. Uh, what are the symptoms of um, emotion pretending to be intuition, when to listen to intuition and when not, etc. And also teach it to actually become a voice for intuition when the intuition is appropriate. There's a pretty good anthology out there. I'll just get it for one sec. Um, just for the uh, uh, listeners. And viewers, um, called uh, rational Intu rational intuition, philosophic roots, scientific investigations. Uh, which okay, is I can't see it right now. <laughs> oh well, well, it's rational intuition, philosophic roots, scientific investigations, edited by Lisa M. Osbeck and Barbara S. Held. I don't think it's a coincidence that the two scientists are women, by the way. Okay, um, so <laughs> might not be. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, so that's that's the gut feeling, which I feel is very important to. Like I said, develop, educate people about, um, build a relationship with a rational mind. And then we have another faculty that very often people also just call intuition, uh, which I actually call inspiration. Oh, yes. And I distinguish between these two. So please. You do. Fantastic. Yeah. Okay. So this is where, you know, like it's the light bulb um, that goes off, uh, the eureka moment, um, et cetera. And um, again, this is super important, I feel, for us to know more about it, to understand that it's connected with very particular processes in the brain. I do a ton of work on this. All right, yes, around. you do a lot of work. But maybe you talk about it, John. I want <laughs> no, to no, 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 I, 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 inspiration and insight. Um, I make a subtle distinction between them. I don't think it's relevant here. The distinction is insight is like, like 
we, we use it generally when we're talking about like a one pro, like one problem. Oh, I had an insight, but uh, Piaget, there is systematicity of error. So there's also the possibility of a, a systematic insight, a more comprehensive insight that affords you aspiring to be something more than you are. That's what I call inspiration, that kind okay. of. Okay. Yes, yeah. I like it. Yeah. Good. Okay. So I sum up both insight and inspiration as, as one faculty. That's fine. And um, yeah, I like the distinction. So what, what I found really fascinating is that um, most people will know this, just like most people will know having a, a, a gut feeling about something. And um, by now, as I'm sure you, you know more than me, but I'll just share what I know, what I researched on it. There is enough research about it to know um, that there is things we can do to increase the probability of having this kind of insight or inspiration. Yeah, I, I do this in one of my lecture courses on thinking and reasoning, and I talk about um, this idea of making yourself more insight prone. Uh, okay, how do you do it? Well, I mean, there's lots of different practices. Uh, uh, some of the practices for experimental work is, um, so uh, you have to do, you have to work a lot with attention um, and mindfulness practices help that uh, because uh, you have to learn to break frame and make new frame. Uh, 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 and so you have to practice doing that. So you want meditative and contemplative practices. Uh, you want to take it deeper into uh, insight, not only into, like I said, problems, but insight into things like roles. What role are you assuming in this situation? What roles are you assigning? Uh, and so what you do is how can you just make insight more likely? And then how can you make systemic and systematic insight more likely? And there's uh, um, so uh, we talk about uh, uh, things like that. Um, in fact, a lot of the course is about all of the scientific work trying to understand what kind of process it is, what affords it, and what undermines it. Fascinating. I would love to read up on that. Is, is, is there a book on it that you have? No. Um, part of my sabbatical is I'm going to try and create an integrated, up-to-date uh, document about the psychology and cognitive science and and neuroscience of insight, and also bringing these ideas about inspiration as systematic and systemic insight that affords aspiration. Uh, Fantastic. Okay, I'm really <laughs> excited about that. So one of the things that, uh, that I found in myself and in the research and also in the people I work with is that it takes the sequence of like really wanting to know something and really grappling with the problem and then, and this is crucial for the mind, for the rational mind to know and to understand, to let it rest. So to actually stop thinking about it, like stop like chewing on it and, and go do something else. What can and I say ideally that? that, sorry? That, yeah, this is, uh, this goes back to Wallace, 1926, who talked about, uh, you know, you work and then there's, uh, there's incubation. And what's been interesting coming out about incubation is it seems to, it's not, uh, the, it, it looks like mild distraction is actually what most affords it. Uh, yes, right? exactly. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Like, so if you think of it just as rest, um, that, no. that, that's, yeah, yeah. So what you want, and it, it might be that the interaction between the default mode network and the task network is a biological thing that allows us to be always slightly distracted. So we're making ourselves generally more insight prone. Yes. And that's why people report having the greatest insights when they're using the bathroom or they're taking yep, a shower exactly. or they're making like, coffee. Yeah, or, yeah, yeah. I mean, that's yeah. when it happens, right? Yeah, yes. Yeah. And it's interesting about, yeah, and, and, and people are trying to zero in on like what makes it, because you don't want the thing you're distracted by to be too sticky or you'll lose yes. the connection. You exactly. Don't want, you, don't, you don't want it to be too loose or it won't actually pull you away enough that you can come back and see it differently. So trying to figure out what that is, is, is really tricky. Okay, wow. I love that people have gone into that so deeply. Oh, I, I, I talk about it deeply in the course I teach on Insight. Yep. Good, 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 good. So, so the, the third um, faculty that I talk about in the inner GPS is the heart intelligence. And that's something that really bothered me that people didn't discern that, that they would say, like, follow your heart, follow your gut, da, da, da. Like, it was really fuzzy, the language around that. And so what, what is that for you, heart intelligence? Yeah, the heart intelligence, it took me a while and, and I, can I tell you a concern I have first? Uh, yes, please. just to, because I don't think you'd be saying this because there's a lot of talk right now about emotional intelligence as a psychological construct, and I have some very significant questions about that. 
scientifically, because if you control, a lot of the research I've seen shows that if you control for measures of general intelligence and, and personality factors and or attachment styles, three other independently well-validated constructs, there's nothing left to emotional intelligence, right? Um, and so I'm very hesitant about it as a construct. And I take it you're saying something different than that. Yes. Yeah. Like I use the term heart intelligence mostly to uh, prime the rational mind that there is something going on there to pay attention to. Ah, okay. So good, good, yeah. good. Okay. So go ahead. We, we, can, we can use a different term for it. But my point is that there is some kind of information processing happening in the heart. So there's an information processing that's happening up here that we talked about. There's an information processing happening in the gut. And there's something that happens in the heart, like physically, that area of the body. Yeah. So, so like 40 Cog side talks about embodiment, which is not just that you have a body that's a vessel, but that part of your cognition is actually being processed by your body uh, yeah. in some important way. Is, is is that closer to what you're talking about? Yes, that's okay. part of part of what I'm talking about. This is why I call it full body thinking. Yeah, yeah, right, right, right. Okay. Yeah, because there's something that happens when people actually tune into their belly, for example. Yeah, all the somatic stuff, all the somatic. Yeah, research. somatic yeah, stuff, yeah, yeah. or they tune into their heart area, center of the chest, um, and and they tune into that, and then they connect to maybe a certain decision that yeah, they need to make. Yeah, you get this feedback loop going. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I get. Yeah, and yeah, yeah. There yeah. is a different, a different understanding that happens, and for me, this understanding, the far as far as I have penetrated it, there's a lot to be said about it. But it has, it's linked to the sense of ethics, meaning, and the good, true, and beautiful. That's yeah, 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 what yeah, yeah. I connected right. to. Oh, cool. So for so, you. That mm -hmm. is, uh, it's sort of a locus of, for how normativity lands in us. That's what the true, the good, and the beautiful are. They're, they're about normativity is what you ought or should, like you should pursue the truth, you should pursue what's good, you should pursue what's beautiful. Um, you should, not just you want, right? That's the important distinction. Is yeah. that... Is yes, that, and I'm a bit hesitant because, the, the, again, it's a language thing, right? You're trying yeah, to put please, it please, yeah, something yeah, yeah. Yeah. that is is transrational so the heart okay so let me try again so people talk not about not not about that as rule i mean a lot of people talk about that as rules that's kant uh, and other people but there's like yaden and others talk about like there's a sense of calling there's a sense yes. of being called to what's right or how you should orient or, or where you should be coming from like it's more about orientation um, is that getting closer? Cause I, I, I do want to do with, I want to play with the words with you until we almost, where it's almost like we're doing dialogical version of Gendlin's focusing, right? We're going back and forth and trying to get what, what, re, what yeah. ends in, so uh, did that so, move, but, uh, move away or? Like, like I, I get the sense that there's a sense of guiding that you're talking about. It guides you in some way. And I'm trying to get, uh, so throw away everything I just said. I want you, I'm trying to provoke you to articulate. What's that guiding? Like, what does that feel like? What does it mean? Well, one of the things that I've discovered in myself and then the people I work with is that we can spend a lot of time thinking about like what's right in a particular situation, like ethically or morally right. And we can like argue back and forth about it and go crazy. And then the moment we really tune into somatically into the heart area, there's a shift that happens and there's just this knowing of what's what's in alignment with the good, the true and the beautiful or uh, an, yeah, an that, ethics that is independent of our cultural norms. Yeah, I think we're talking about the same thing, actually. But uh, yeah, I, I also think we're think, talking about the same thing. And, and this is why, like, and, and I mean, I, I love your definition uh, of, of sin and virtue. Yeah, yeah. And it's kind of the same thing, you know, if we put it into how we ought to behave, like we're so close to morality and yeah. it almost has nothing to do with it. I think that's no. where morality originally came from, but then it became like this weird thing and it actually took us away often from what yeah. I call hard intelligence. Well, I think that the, what you just said, uh, where it's not about, because we have all kinds of research, by the way, and and... and we all know this anecdotally about the person who can engage in powerful moral reasoning, and that's not predictive of them being good people, uh, right? And so it's this other thing. It's about sort of like like I, 
uh, you may not like the term and that's fine, but that's what I'm trying to convey with this sense of it orients us. And I'm trying to pick up on the, the old language, the metanoia, the conversion, the turning. Like it sounds like what you're talking about is it, it turns and tunes us uh, in the way we should go. Is that landing for you? Totally. That, okay, that's what I'm trying to get at, that turning and tuning function. Yes. And what it does is it very much... Yeah, I'm just pausing for a moment because there's so much there. There's so Take much your time. Sil Aporia is part of Dialogos. Yes. So one thing to be said about the heart is that it's important to understand it can be immature and sentimental and romantic. And that's not what I'm talking about. So, so is it fair to say that all of these, and is this part of the relation to the rational? All of these need education. Like yes, we can't, of course. We can, but the rational yeah, also needs education. <laughs> of course, of course. But 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 part of what we're doing is right. It, 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 is yeah. there's there's the, the okay. I, I make a distinction between rational, which is because I've given up on trying to get people to change the meaning of that term. That's the logical linear thing. But we have this other word that still survives, which is being reasonable. Which isn't about that. It's about seeing things in proper proportion and taking up the right role and responsibility with the most perspicacious perspective on a situation. That's the reasonable. And so uh, we're trying to get all these faculties to be reasonable and they need to be exactly. educated to some degree. Is that, is that you, you're yes. nodding and smiling, so that's landing well for you. Good, okay. Yes, so yeah. that's exactly what uh, I feel a lot of this is about, like your work and my work, to see that in many ways, reason has been equated with rationality and we both know that that's been a big mistake. Yeah, big mistake. And to reinstate reason as something holistic, as, some, as something that comes out of the interaction of more faculties. Yeah, yeah, that's good. Okay, so I'm getting the sense now of all of these are immature. They're all developmental. They're not just sort of given, right? I mean, the faculties are there, but they need to be educated and, and matured. Um, and I, I, there's a subtle distinction there. We might want to return. I mean, you can educate something that's not necessarily the same as maturing it. The two overlap to some degree in significant ways because uh, people can be educated without committing to what they've been educated in. And that's they can still be immature with their education is what I'm saying. Um, so, so far, we've got uh, uh, we've got we've got three so far. Uh, we've got intuition. We've got inspiration. We've got what you're calling heart intelligence. All of these are lining up with. I mean. I, I, you know, and this is one of the things that struck us at Bergerac. I mean, we didn't know each other until then. And yet there's just this, I think, really profound. And I mean that. And it's not hyper, hyperbole. I think there's this really profound convergence between your work and mine. And I, I think it's extremely powerful. And like you, uh, I am, I, 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 I feel that people aren't doing enough on what we're doing right here, right now, this deep phenomenology of the transrational. And is so, so important. Um, so, so, so keep going. I'm, I'm, my, I'm all, I'm, I'm all, I, I'm anticipating the, the, the next two because these first yes. three have been so rich and juicy. Good. So the fourth obviously is rationality, which we need to kind of revisit. Like one of the things that I've observed is that rationality in, in our culture, and this is particularly true in Germany, has been completely burdened. Uh, by tasks that it's not actually equipped for. Yeah. Oh, so the misaligning of this Cartesian model with yes. uh, so poor fit between um, this Cartesian model and, and uh, tasks that it's given. Yes. Yes. Yeah. It's, so, in, 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 in the Gokris makes this argument also as well. Yes. Yes. Yeah. So what happens obviously is that, for example, I mean, I've given one example that the mind can argue endlessly um, what's good in a particular situation and what's the right thing to do. Uh, but also when it comes to when is a good moment to act or what, what is, what is the right decision? We will have to also listen to the intuition, the true intuition that will have to be incorporated. And if the mind tries to decide without, I mean, there's been like Antonio Damasio's work, um, I feel has been really revealing in that there yeah, is yeah, no, yeah, yeah. There's yeah. no thinking without feeling. There's no decision making without feeling. So totally, totally. I think well, it ties into that. And you use so, feeling in Damasio's sense, right? If I remember correctly, um, it's sorry. 
you used feeling more in Damasio's sense than um, the way a lot of people might be. Some people as, uh, associate feeling just with sort of uh, tactile or appropriate. Like yeah, simple. no. Yeah, 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 yeah. I used feeling in, in more in the, yeah, feeling emotional sense, but I use emotions different. So no, no, it can I, be messy. But we, we, I think we understand each other. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, um, so I, I want to ask you a question because now we're on rationality and part of my criticism of rationality, of course, is, and you've, I've, I've alluded it to already is, uh, we've reduced, we, we've put it in service of propositional tyranny that the only way we know is propositionally. And of course that leaves out the procedural, that leaves out the perspectival, that leaves out the participatory. And, um, and I think rationality should have been about, because if you go back to logos and ratio, it was more about this reasonableness, which was, well, for all of these ways of knowing, how do I best overcome self-deception and how do I best enhance religio, being deeply and reciprocally connected to the world, right? It's this connectedness that's so central. Meaning in life is central to that notion of rationality, and, and it's completely orthogonal to our modern notion of rationality. Um, but like I said, I've sort of give, I've sort of given up. Uh, people, I've been making this argument for a very long time, very publicly, and people just keep still. As soon as they hear rational, they think Descartes logic, linear. So yeah. I'm gonna let them have that. And yes. I've I've now been talking about reasonable. That is yes, all. Yes, let's these, do that. Yeah. I, <laughs> yeah. 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 Okay. So yeah, sometimes it's good to acknowledge that certain words have been stolen and have a certain meaning that we're not going to change Can't back. We, I mean, and even though the word ration and ratio are right in the word rational, we've completely lost yes. all, all of yes. that. Okay, so it. so we're, we're on the same page about this. Please continue. Mm. So what happens is the mind needs to be, the rational mind needs to be educated about the other faculties. It needs to develop a new humility by understanding that the other faculties have um, abilities that the rational mind itself does not have. So it has access to information and ways of processing information that the rational mind doesn't have access to. That's all something that the rational mind can be informed about, and it greatly changes how the rational mind interacts with the others. Well, well this goes towards work I'm trying to get published right now uh, on rational. Uh, rationality and relevance realization, all the work that's coming out of what's called ecological uh, 4E cog sci around. And this goes towards this small and large world. Like when you're in a, when, like you can use uh, rationality within small worlds, but it's actually unreasonable to use it in large world situations. Um, and and I, I, we're, I'm hoping to get that paper. And there's a lot of formal argumentation uh, 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 and evidence for around that. But it, it, uh, what I'm saying is, I think there's good argument and evidence to back the claim you just made. Mm -hmm. Good. Thank you. <laughs> Always happy to hear that. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, because of my appreciation for the scientific method. That's the thing. Like I've kind of had to uh, go my own way and do my own research in a completely different way. And I've always done my best to kind of revisit what's coming out of the scientific method to kind of check. And that's kind of exactly the process that we need to be doing. Like we need to uh, match what's coming out of the transrational faculties uh, with the rational mind. And we need to do that also in our daily life. <laughs> is that one of the function? Is that one of the proper functions of rationality to yes. help you bring the best findings of the best science into uh, this whole inner ecology that you're talking about. Is that one of the things? That, that's one possibility. I mean, also what I find really fascinating, and this is kind of what I think a lot of your work actually is, is to create a new mythology that is science-based and that gives us a way of meaning making and also gives us access again to these transrational faculties, which are key to meaning making. This is powerful. Um, oh by, by making the mind understand them, but having a mythology that uh, yeah, it's science-based, okay, so, so you can't dismiss it. So, the, I mean, I, I won't go into it uh, because uh, uh, I've got a whole thing around this and, you know, after Socrates, but this is Socratic self-knowledge. It's not your autobiography. It's what I meant when I tried to say this is like your owner's manual. This is about learning all of this and learning about yeah. the phenomenology and the functionality of each, what's appropriate, how they can correct each other, how they can relate to each other, which is a platonic model, by the way. It's in the Republic. I, yeah, this is so good. When is your book? I, you're making me really. Uh, We're working on it right now. First, <laughs> emotional backpack. Because if you want me to write a blurb for your book, the Energy PS, yes. I will. Yes, please. 
Please, okay. John. I would love that. I, well, so get, so yeah. And one of the advantages for me is I get an earlier man, manuscript. Yes, yeah. you, will, uh, you will get it as soon as it's in, in, a, in a readable version, which will be I will. Soon. I will definitely write a blurb for this. This is beautiful. This I will help oh, promote no. this. This is so great. Happy. Because this is, see what I'm trying to do, like, I'm trying to make this stuff as simple as possible, but not too simple. So kind of like an app. I know it's <laughs> really hard. People can eh? really apply it. Yeah. I talk about the distinction between stepping down the way a transformer steps down electrical current, right? And dumbing down and trying to find the, or get the stepping down without dumbing down. Yeah, uh, I'm, that's I'm actually, what I'm looking for. <laughs> yeah. 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 So. Mm. Okay, so rationality. The other thing is that the rational mind is really, really good with linear time, with logistics, with budgets, with restraints, with accounting. Resources. Hmm? Accounting. Accounting, yeah. It's very good with accounting, which I mean this very broadly, putting things into a table and be, being able to give an account of them and where everything came from and where everything's going. Yes, and also... So, so we might have this great inspiration, you know, to, to write a book or to do, do this or that. And then the intuition is like, oh, yes, there's a lot of energy for that. Let's do that. And the heart says, the yes, it's completely in line. Hmm? <laughs> you need the planning, though. <laughs> exactly. And then it's like, okay, when am I going to do it? And the mind says, you're going to need to take a sabbatical. <laughs> yep, exactly. Yeah, to have the time for it, to have the resources for it. So that's where the mind, like, it becomes very... Uh, it's very practical. And then it will sometimes go back to the other faculties and say, look, guys, this is a really great idea, but we can't do it. Or how are we going to pay the rent, you know? And then the other faculties can also process that and maybe come up with suggestions. But it's it's like an internal dialogue, of course, nonverbal, <laughs> but it's an internal dialogue between the different faculties that we need. So I want to come back to that because I think, I want, and maybe I, I'm going to suggest we do a third episode because we're, 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 yeah, where we talk, I want to get into the phenomenology of the internal dialogue. Because it's not, it's like you said, it's not verbal. So it's really more dialogos than dialogue. I, I, I'm hearing, and you know that I'm just like, yeah, I want to get into that profoundly. Uh, but uh, we, we still have the fifth. Uh, There's the fifth. <laughs> yeah. So the fifth, um, the fifth is really interesting. And I, I learned a lot about this in other. Uh, cultures and other traditions, um, and its intention. Oh, say uh, say more about that because that doesn't usually come up on uh, um, uh, on uh, on some of the lists I'm familiar with. But I, I, I I'm, I'm so this is this is really interesting because the others, like you talked about uh, the the two lines, like the vertical and the linear, right? So the rational is very good at the linear, and the other three faculties, like they form a vertical line in our system, right? And they're all three are very much receptive. So they're listening. Yeah, yeah, right? yeah, yeah. Yeah, I, I think now, about it that way. I think about it as this way is the speaking and this is more the listening. Yes, yes, yes exactly. Yeah. But we have a transrational faculty that is also proactive, that is not receptive, and that's intention. And this is, it's, it's, it's really challenging for people to understand in our um, cultural framework, I find, because we very quickly confuse it with goals. Say that but again. That, no, no, say that again, Vivian. That was a gem. Say that again. We quickly confuse intention with a goal. Right, 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 right. Say more about However, that. However, intention is like an inner movement where... I direct myself towards something. So, for example, we both have an intention to contribute in some way to the evolution of our species. And that is an intention that is deeply informed by our transrational faculties, like it came out of a profound space in both of us. We never talked about this, but I know this. <laughs> no, no, right? for sure. Yeah. yeah. So, is it sort of the way you're? The way you're shaping your agency is yes. that what? Oh, yes. yes, yes, okay. And and it's very powerful, and many people are not aware of this. So many people, when they open to the transrational, they become very passive. It's kind of like, well, God knows where I live, and if He needs me, He can come by. Yeah, 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 yeah. And this overlaps with spiritual bypassing all over the place. Yes. Yeah. And then, of course, God doesn't come by, and it's like, well, I guess He doesn't need me, and. What I like to compare it to is like if you if you're like super receptive and connected and you've done you're doing your work to be to to be in the religio and da da da, 
but you don't have an intention, then it's like you're going sailing, but you're not pulling up the sail. And a lot of people end up in that kind of limbo state and they don't understand that even if you move into the transpersonal, which we haven't really talked about, and I think we should talk about that at some point as well, but not today, which of course correlates with the transrational, then you still have an agency. You don't just become passive receptive. I like this. Uh, for me, that's the, the shaping of your agency is like the cornerstone of what participatory knowing is. Uh, uh, so, can, can you say more about that? Just another sentence. So for me, participatory knowing is the knowing that comes from how there's this co-shaping of us as agent and the world as arena so that we fit together. And without that fitting together, without the aletheia, all the other knowings aren't possible. And this isn't a knowing that you can sort of egoically take charge of. You can, ref you can educate it uh, egoically, but because it ultimately emerges, right? Because the ego ultimately emerges out of this, this is a trans-egoic function in a very important way. Um, and so I think, and, and this knowing by being, it's where, you, it's where the distinction between how you're knowing the world and how you're knowing on yourself blurs and blends. Like how you know your most beloved. You know them in the way that you're different and how you differently know yourself. And those two can't be separated from each other. And so, and, and then, and the mystical tradition, you know, love is its own kind of knowing. And the, 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 the Latin there, uh, is noticia. It, love is its own kind of noticing. Um, right. And love, of course, is again, it's not right. It is this shaping of your agent to another person and then like, and allowing them to shape you. Right. And, uh, and that sort of thing. That's the participatory knowing. And I think it comes to its ultimate fruition in mystical states in which the distinction between seeing and being and knowing and selfing, they all just, they all just collapse. And you're back down to this very, very basic, you know, connectedness, fittedness, oneness, hereness, nowness, fullness, yes. that sort of thing. Yes. Did that, so, is that enough to just give you a I mean, I have a whole bunch totally, of- like, No, this, this I'm clear about. And uh, what I was interested in is that you said that into, in, into- Intention. Intention is a cornerstone for, of um, this kind of knowing. Well, intention in your sense, not in the sense that most people use it. Most people mean this representation of a goal and intend, oh, right, leaning towards it, where this is, no, no, you're talking about you're shaping your agency so that you- Shaping become, agency, yeah, yes. Yeah, yes, yes. And this is, this is so important um, and, and because in the transpersonal, like you just described it so beautifully, because there is a sense of loss even of the typical egoic sense of self. That's right. Which is another thing I'd love to talk to you about at some point. Um, there can be a sense of a loss of uh, a sense of agency. If you identify the ego with the agent. But of course, exactly. things like the flow experience show you that you can go trans-egoic and enhance your agency. This is what is sought after in the martial arts. If you try and spar or fight egoically, you're doomed. But if you can drop into the flow state, your agency is actually better shaped for yes. the situation you're in. And that's, that's a beautiful example because in martial arts, you work with very clear intentions. Like you yes, know what you're doing. Exactly. <laughs> you're not just doing anything, but you have a very clear intention. So, so I want to ask you a question. And, and um, so for me, I, I see a sort of an Aristotelian thing here where the shaping of agency and the development of character overlap. Like shaping of agency is in the uh, sort of more online in the moment. And then shaping of character is you've built these more, these larger sets of constraints on how you regularly shape your agency. Uh, does that land for you? Does that make sense? It does. It's, it's a completely different terminology than and I usually use, and it completely lands. So Excellent. 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 So the, uh, let's just check in because uh, we're, we're coming to an end. This is uh, like... So we have at least a third, and here's two things we want to talk about. We want to talk about, and I think they might go together well. First of all, we, we need to follow this up with what's the phenomenology and the functionality of this internal dialogos between the five, if I can put it yes. that way. Yes, right? let's talk about that. We want to talk about that. And then that should put us into the discussion, what's the relationship between the transrational, now fully elucidated, 
and the transpersonal, which we've been touching on here and there. And what and 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 and, and then I think that would also uh, overlap because when you talk about the transpersonal, we start talking about transegoic stuff as well. And I think so. Let's we can look at those three trends together: the transrational, the transpersonal, the transegoic. How about that for our next topic to to pick yes. it up? Yes, would love to talk about that. And uh, of course, we'll start by uh, becoming really clear on how we use those terms and what we mean by them. And I'm sure we're going to sure. pick that up. Yeah, uh, but let's finish, like, like I say, as bridging, let's finish, because I don't want to start it now because we're almost out of time, but let's finish by, oh yeah, but what's the dialogos between the five, right? Because that, that we, you've gestured towards that a couple times and you've said they, they need to have this mutually educating, mutually correcting uh, relationship to each other. Uh, checking in with each other, listening to each other, dialoguing with each other. And I want to unpack that because inner dialogos, the relationship between inner dialogos and outer dialogos is really, really uh, central uh, to my work. And so we'll start there and then we'll go into the transrational, the transpersonal and the transegoic. How about that? How does that sound for a yes, proposal? Super excited about it already. Okay, Vivian, uh, I always give my guests um, the last word, and you can choose how you want it to be. It can be summative, it can be review, it can be inspirational, um, whatever you want to say, uh, just as mm -hmm. the last word. First of all, I want to say that I feel like uh, I've had a really, really good meal. Like I feel like I've feasted in this <laughs> dialogue, and I'm really, really happy. Thank you so much for having me, John. Really great. So I feel it's been an amazing walk we've taken and I really hope that you watching this have followed us, not just with the rational mind, trying to understand, also trying to get the words, but really listen to it with your whole body. And if you haven't, I want to encourage you to go back and see what happens when you listen to it with your whole body. I call it not just full body thinking, but full body listening. And it's quite fascinating when people do it. Initially, they often feel like they're missing something and they're not getting it. I want to invite you to risk that and see if maybe there is a different level of getting it that's happening in your system. Um, and you can always, you know, go back and try to understand what we're saying, which might also be interesting. Um, but that's something I want to actually encourage you to do with this dialogue. Vivian, yeah, that notion of full body listening, that's a wonderful way to end. Thank you so very much. I like, like you, I feel deeply nourished by this and I look forward to our next one. Yes, me too. Thank you so much, John.